Oh man, love that. I love that. Thanks everyone for welcome back. Another uh, episode of Open Shutter, the first Wednesday of February. It's Groundhog Day, and apparently we're getting six yeah. more weeks of winter, so we figured we celebrate yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. We are it's all nice currently booking our flights to somewhere warm. Well, yeah, currently it's snowing outside, so yeah, quite fitting. It's supposed to be getting ten centimeters, so let's celebrate that action. And yeah, uh, yeah thanks everyone for jumping on, and uh, welcome back, Jason, to the show. He's been on the show a couple of times, and uh, he always rocks it. So if you guys are into film photography, this is the show for you guys. So um, thanks to everyone who comes back every week. And if this is your first time watching us and you don't know who we are, we all have YouTube channels, including including Jason's. Mm -hmm. Jason's Instagram and YouTube is uh, linked in the description. Go check his stuff out. And if you don't know who I am, uh, based in Toronto and do vlogs, documentaries, small business interviews, a bunch of stuff, and uh, also do the open shutters from time from time to time. So, thanks everyone for jumping on, and uh, throw it to Mr. McGowan for a little. How do you do? Who are you? What do you do? Hello, hello, happy Wednesday, everybody. Um, I'm Brampton, Ontario-based photographer, videographer, do all kinds of photo stuff, and uh, on YouTube I do ghost hunting, and uh, yeah. I did a ghost hunting video with Paul you at did. the Oakville Museum. Recently did a ghost hunting video with Laura, which was crazy. If you haven't watched yeah. it, go watch it. And uh, yeah, happened. it's having fun. Anyway, let's go uh, to Mr. That way to Mr. Evans. Evans, you're on mute. All right, all right, all right. Uh, <laughs> welcome back, everybody. Welcome to another Wednesday, another open shot alive. Yeah, oh, <clears> glad to have you guys with us. Um, Especially very excited when Jason is around because yeah. we know you're going to learn a lot. So Thanks. let's have fun tonight. Um, go check out everybody's Instagram or the links and, and YouTube or the links are below. Um, yeah. We are always grateful for you guys for supporting this show for almost two years now. So Almost, man. Yeah. Almost. Almost. We're gonna have two years. We haven't missed a week. I have not missed yeah. a week. I think that's understated. Nice. Yeah, pandemic. Paul hasn't made the week. I think I made I the week. Episode, I've had this one or two episodes, but Paul's been there every single I've day. I've been at this for two years. years. I'm still waiting for yeah. a paycheck. So nice. <laughs> Excellent. Now, I guess. Hey, if, if if anyone's getting paid, it's Jason. So um, oh, I don't thanks, know Jason, back again. Um, you know, like I say, I think you're probably one of the best presenters we ever we've oh, ever had. So maybe like a quick intro about who are you. I'm Jason, uh, Jason Foley, and uh, I'm an amateur photographer. I'm based here in Brampton as well. And uh, by trade, I play with spreadsheets and stuff all day long. So it, it truly is a, is a hobby for me. Um, but I dabble in a little bit of everything. So uh, my YouTube channel is called Critters to Cosmos, which I think is very fitting. Uh, I love everything from insect macro photography to shooting images of galaxies and, uh, and nebula and everything in between. And um, and I'd say as of about June of last year, I've now jumped down the rabbit hole of film photography in, in, a, in a big way. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and it's uh, just such a great hobby and a great community. And, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, both feet in. So, so a couple of weeks yeah. ago, if you guys watched the show, we had Vitaly on, who's also into film mm -hmm. photography, which went great. And I think Jason, uh, in this episode, he wants to, because Jason develops his own film at home. So I think he mm -hmm. kind of want to, he wants to have the show centered around how to how to develop your own film so um yeah. you know if you guys have questions about how to develop film at home feel free to post them in the chat and we can yeah. uh try to get them answered uh, but maybe i'll throw it over to jason maybe like, sure. like how do you want to how do you want to start this off yeah if i could jump right in i have a little yeah. bit of a you know me i like to have a little bit of a presentation so um yeah <laughs> um but you, you you touched on exactly where i was going to start uh with vitaly's uh, great presentation a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. um and I have to give a plug. The guy works for Downtown Camera, which is spectacular. Yeah. Um, my my gosh, if I if I lived any closer to that place, I would have no money left because it's, yeah. uh, <laughs> it's such such a fantastic store for both digital and they have walls of film cameras. So it's like, oh, keep me out of there. Yeah. But um, but Vitaly was great, and and he talked a lot about the the cost of entry to photography. So of course he talked about buying um, uh, film cameras today, which uh, thankfully there's quite a good selection of them out there. Um, that you can get relatively inexpensively. And then he also talked about the costs of developing film through a lab, some, actually something right. like Downtown Camera. Um, the cost of not only developing, but having them scan your negatives for you and sending you a digital, a digital copy of that picture. And 
so where I wanted to follow up with that, because that is absolutely a great point of entry into film photography. And it's actually what I did when I started. Okay. But um, if I, if, I re, if I rewind a little bit back here to early last year, uh, I reached out to somebody, someone who's become a very good friend, and his name's Jim. Um, okay. He's somebody that I was following online. I reached out just to ask some questions about film photography because he does a lot of it. And mm -hmm. it was first about equipment. Uh, but in our discussions right away, he mentioned that he develops his own film. And I was just, you know, mind blown. I had no idea you could even uh, do that yourself. Right. So fast forward now, uh, you know, here we are in February. And I'm really, really proud to say that I, I you know, I, I buy the film. I take the photos. I develop the film here at home. I scan my yeah. own negatives. And uh, a full process. process. A to Z, the full, whole journey. I do the full process from end to end. And. <laughs> It's not nearly as daunting as it first sounded yeah. to, to me when I started out. So, yeah. um, so why don't I kind of jump in? Jump in. Um, just start off. Just start where yeah. you want to start off. Uh, Kim, is that a question? Coffee or chemical? I don't know. If there's a comment. I don't know if that's a question <laughs> or. A I think I, I think I might know. Uh, okay. Now I have not done this. Apparently, you can develop okay. film and coffee. Oh, can um, you? Yes, oh. you can. I have not okay. done that. But uh, so in my case, I use chemicals. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> that might be what that might be about, but um, All right. well, yeah. So, so what I put together here, guys, real quick, and I'm just going to share uh, just a, a bit of a different view here. Um, okay. I wanted to touch on really quickly the type of film that I've been using, and just oh, a couple sorry, of cameras. Quickly, quickly, yeah. Paul, can you make a mm. yeah. screen, yes, screen? Oh, full screen? screen? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, we got you. Yeah. Okay, there we go. better yet. Go ahead. Okay, so so really quickly, I'm just going to go over what you're looking at here. So it, what I think most of us, certainly in my age group anyways, we're familiar with 35 millimeter film. Um, that's a 35 millimeter frame right there. That's a piece of uh, 35 mil film. They come in a canister, typically 24 exposures up to 36 exposures. Don't worry, this is one that I've previously already wrecked. Um, it's exposed, but it's a great test roll. Uh, so that's probably the most common thing. Um, the price of entry into shooting 35 mil, I think is, there's tons and tons of options out there that you can buy used. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one of my favorite here, a Yashica uh, FX3. Um, very, very simple to load, 35 mil. And um, that's, a, that's a great place uh, to start. Um, okay. I also, now funny enough, in my case though, I jumped straight into medium format. And this here is a negative from a film, this is called 120 film. And mm -hmm. you can see right away the difference in size from one negative to the next, um, where you typically get 24 to 36 exposures on a 35 mil, you'll get 12 exposures uh, on this roll of film in this square format crop. Um, this camera here is called a Zeiss Icon Netar. Mm -hmm. And this one here, you can see it's a square a uh, square crop that it captures. This one's from uh, roughly 19, 1953, 1954 that one hmm. and then so funny enough when i first i mentioned reaching out to jim last year when i first reached out you know i was kind of bragging i said you know i really want to dive into medium format or large format mm -hmm. and so he kind of gave me a little heads up about large format that's what this is here this is a four by five sheet of film mm -hmm. um this does not come in rolls this comes in sheets and okay. uh this is the type of camera that this goes in this is a graphlex um a crown graphic this is actually a okay. press camera from the 1950s. Um, okay. What's different with this one is that you load it into an actual film holder, something like this here. And right. you would put two sheets of film, one on each side, and it gets loaded to the back of that camera. Now, thankfully, uh, you know, at, at first I was told that sheet film, if you get into color film, can cost upwards of $10 for every sheet. Mm -hmm. So that's not where I wanted to start. <laughs> so oh, no. I kind of I kind of jumped into that a little bit later on. I started with medium format. Um, so that's kind of a very quick, uh, quick overview of the type of, of equipment that I'm okay. using. And I'm just okay. going to move these away real fast. So you so you so you prefer shooting medium format? I, I yeah, you know what I do. And now, I mean, 35 mil is, is this is very, very convenient. Like I said, you get a lot more exposures on the roll. Yeah. And um, the cost is a little bit better but the detail that you get in these two here right if you think about sensor size right yeah. and you think about mm -hmm. pixels um mm -hmm. this is just basically almost you know three to four times the information that i'm capturing uh, on that negative 
this one here is, is now again, just, uh, you know, an exponential right. increase in the amount of detail. And okay. when so I, when I actually shoot full frame, Jason, and go eight by 10. What's that? Sorry. When are you going to shoot full frame and go eight by 10? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I'm pacing myself. I'm really pacing <laughs> myself. Yeah. And I mean, some of those cameras are absolutely gorgeous, right? The field cameras and, uh, but that's on another level. I'm not there yet. <laughs> um, but uh, so that's the type of film. Now, when it comes to, um, oh, I want to touch on one other thing about that film. Sure. So when, and Vitaly talked about the costs uh, of, of these, and mm -hmm. I want to say, you know, for a roll of uh, 35 mil, I think you can get them for like maybe eight bucks, seven, eight bucks. Yeah. Um, the medium format now you're jumping up to 10 11 dollars for black and white you know it can get up to 16 17 dollars for um uh for for color right. and then a box of that one that i showed you there for the large format you know that's now getting up there three dollars probably per sheet you know 75 bucks for a box of 25. so yeah. definitely you know starting point for um I, I would say 35 mil is probably a really a nice place for for people to start mm -hmm. um but there's another way that you can get cost down a little bit further even. Uh, this is called a bulk loader. And inside of this, I'm certainly not going to open it because I will ruin a very nice roll of film. But um, there's actually a 100 meter length of black and white 35 mil film in here. Um, think of it almost, it almost looks like a roll of tape. <laughs> and yeah. this is loaded in here. This is actually a uh, reusable film canister that you can see. Okay. So I'll hold that yeah. up there. Yeah. So I can load this into this holder and I can actually load onto this canister as many frames as I want to. I could load on 10 if I just want to have a test roll. I can load right. uh, as many as the 36, right? This is definitely mm -hmm. a way to get that cost down even further. And um, I, mm -hmm. I picked that up and, and this to me just means I can I can shoot that more, much more often, right? I, I purchased several of these little canisters and yeah. um, it's a great way to go. There's a few different models uh, of bulk loaders, but it's it's a nice, um, definitely cool. a nice way to go. How much how much is the bulk loader? Uh, this bulk average? loader, I want to say it was ninety, I believe ninety ninety five dollars. Uh, so and you just buy that anywhere? Like it's. Uh, I bought this online. There's some great uh, great stores here uh, in Canada. So there's obviously downtown camera, but there's there's a couple of great ones in Vancouver. There's a fantastic film presence out in Western BC or out in Western Canada. Um, yeah. So there's a, a good store called Carysdale. There's another one called Bow Photo. I find okay. between those two and Downtown Camera, yeah, they pretty much have everything you could ever want. And okay. um, once you once you purchase over a hundred bucks, it's free shipping. So you know you just kind of wait until you need a few different things and um, hmm. and, and do it that way. Interesting. So, yeah. So shout out so that's, so that's a bulk loader. Kim has a question. Have you ever used a one twenty seven mil? Ansco. 127 mil. I have not. No. The answer is no, Kim. No. Sorry, Kim. Sorry, Kim. <laughs> I'm still I'm still relatively new to uh <laughs> newish. Now, okay, so I'm gonna fast forward real quick to um actually developing the film. So Man, this is exciting. <laughs> I know I'm just going I'm gonna I have a lot to race through. So um <laughs> now when you think about developing film. I think something that comes to mind for probably anybody is a dark room. Uh, yeah. We know that as you expose film uh, to light, uh, that's, that's yeah. the whole point here. But if you, if you don't have a dark space to develop that film and you're again, you're going to ruin that film. Um, I don't have a dark room and I have a man cave that I work in here. Um, and technically I could probably get it dark enough to, to make it a dark room, but I'm just not quite comfortable enough. I've heard too many stories of, you know, uh, one of the kids quickly opening the door and saying, "Hey, what do you what do you want for dessert, Dad?" Uh -huh. and, and all of a sudden, all <laughs> oh, of a sudden, no. your your film is ruined. So there yeah. is an alternative, and I'm going to really quickly come back okay. to my main oh, camera. The alternative to, to the dark room. The alternative to the dark room. Really yeah, can, show you. And you convert the film to digital photo. Yeah, we're gonna we're, we're oh gonna we're going to get to that for sure. Yeah, don't worry, we got you covered, man. We got you covered so this here, it's kind of hard to hold it up and get you to see the whole thing, but this is what's called a dark bag. Um, think of it as a portable uh, dark room. So okay. what this has, and this might be hard to see, see this hole on the end here? Yes. yes. There's two of them, one for each of my arms that go inside. Okay. Oh. At the opposite end of the bag, it's an open, uh, has a zipper at the other end in Velcro. So I place this dark bag on my desk and then I load into it everything that I would need to operate within a dark room. So I'll put the film canister that I want to develop. 
I'll put one of these little uh, developing mm -hmm. tanks, which I'm going to talk about in a second. A pair of scissors, all the equipment that I need gets put into that dark bag. I right. zip it up, Velcro it up. My arms go into either side and it's elastic up around yeah. your arms. Yeah. I, now, I now have a dark space to work in. And wow. the first time I, now imagine you're doing all this blind. Uh, you, yeah. You're doing it all by feel. And when I show you what you have to do, again, it, it seems daunting at first, but um, I nailed it, I think, the first time. I was pretty proud, and uh, cool, you get man. you get quite good at it. So I wanted to show you the dark bag before I advanced to the, the, dark the, next, the next little thing here. So I'm just going to go back to this here. So this is called a Patterson developing tank. And I'll take this apart. I'm going to disassemble it really quickly. So oh. here we go. So this comes out. Now you'll see on the inside that it's got a couple of canisters, or sorry, reels. Now, this is what goes inside my dark bag. So let's say I was developing, just for argument's sake, we'll say I was developing this one roll of 35 mil film. Okay. This would go inside my dark bag. The film would go in with the canister, put it in like this, and all of this would go into the dark bag with a pair of scissors, okay? Okay. Now that I'm inside the dark bag, I would pull the film out all the way to the end, right. cut it. So now I'm just, I just have the film in my hand. Okay. You'd open up this canister. Now I'm again doing all this in the dark. Crazy. Are you doing this in the dark? Inside the bag in the dark. Yeah. So <laughs> this canister here, you'll see that this is configured right now for the width of a 35 mil film. You can see that there. This canister actually extends open. So I can now put a piece of 120 film, a roll of 120 film in there. So this mm -hmm. this can't this uh, reel is good for both 35 mil and the 120. Okay, but so again, I'm inside the dark bag. I will wind this film around this reel, and there's actually little slots here, and you just get you get good at it after a while. Inside the dark, you just feed it in, and then once it gets started, there's kind of a little twisting action that I can load the film all the way around this reel. Until I have it completely wound on here. And it goes back inside the tank like that. Close the top. And once I lock this shut, that is now light tight. So hmm. I can remove this now from the dark bag and it's safe. Light cannot oh. get at that film. Okay. Okay. So now I'm ready to develop this film. And this is where I'm going to really quickly flip over to chemicals so um, when it comes to developing film uh, there's different chemicals for black and white and color film but i'm going to talk about black and white right now so there's there's three three steps actually four technically four steps but uh, the first chemical on the left hand side here is the developer the middle one is called the stop bath and the one on the right is called the fixer and each has its own purpose um, to explain it really quickly uh, I don't know if I'll do this any justice, but um, film film itself is actually um, there's there's something on it called silver highlight, and it's little grains that are actually embedded in the cellulose uh, film, and they're light sensitive. So when you expose that film to light, it actually changes uh, where where the light has actually hit that silver highlight. It, it changes the, the 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 chemistry of that. It turns it into silver, actual silver. So what the developing chemical does is it uh how do i best explain this sorry when you put it in the developer that converts the exposed silver highlight into silver so that's the first step that's what the developer does the stop bath will stop the process so and this is all very time specific so the stop bath will stop that process after a specific number of minutes and then the fixer is what rinses away all the excess silver highlight that was not exposed to film so hopefully uh, exposed to light. So hopefully you followed that. Um, and then the wow. last one here is just a a non. Uh, it's like a, an agent to keep spots from developing on the on the film as it's drying. Right. So typically uh, the next frame I'll show you here will show you what I have to do when I go to develop. Uh, the chemicals are also temperature sensitive, and the film has to be uh, developed with chemicals that are at a specific temperature for black mm. and white film i believe it's around 20 degrees celsius color film is closer to 38 degrees um and 
this is actually color chemical that you're looking at here. And this device here that I have, this is simply called a sous vide. And I don't know if any of you have heard of a sous vide. Uh, yeah. I hadn't up until I started to develop film. But I cook with them. So yeah, cook with them. What yeah. is it? Yeah. What is it? It, it heats up water so you can essentially poach foods in the water. Um, you uh, you would uh, you set it to a certain temperature. It'll rise. It'll raise the water to that temperature and hold it there. Uh, and it just so happens that it's a great tool to use when you're trying to set the temperature for chemicals for developing. Yeah. Power. So and is there like what's the ratio for all these chemicals? Is it all the same? Like, how do you uh, know? No. So it's a great great question, Paul. Um, so when you buy these chemicals, and there's different brands. Um, I use one by a company called. Um, uh, Ilford, and uh, it, it tells you right when you when you buy the film, there's a ratio. So it comes as a pure uh, the concentrate, and then it might be like a nineteen to one ratio or a twenty five to one ratio. Mm. So the process every time I go to develop film is I have these beakers. I'll first <clears throat> put in the necessary amount of chemicals, and then I top it up with distilled water, and uh, and then I put it into this bath to bring it up to the temperature that I want it. So just on the on the temperature front, before you move on from the yeah. temperature. Yeah. If if you were to use a different temperature, would yeah. you get a different effect on your film? Well, or would it not work? No, I think well, well, color film is much less tolerant. Uh, color film okay. has to be quite specific. Um, you so it's interesting. So there's an app that I used, and I want to say it's called. Oh my gosh, off the top of my head, it's not coming to me. But um, it's it's an app that actually you can when you, when you start it up, you can specify what size of film you're trying to develop what chemical you're using. And what it will do is it'll give you essentially a recipe for that developing. So it'll say, okay, okay. the developer needs to be 11 minutes long at 20 degrees Celsius. One of the mm -hmm. things I can do is I can say, well, I need to correct the temperature. My water is actually, it went up to 21 degrees. I can go into the app, change the water temperature to 21 degrees. It'll typically lessen the amount of time by 30 seconds, let's say. So. The, the temperature and the time are relative to each other. Okay. Um, so, so that, yeah, I've always try, I try very hard to work with the box temperatures that they want, the 20 but degrees. It's not something that you can play around with for different creative results. What you can play with. Okay. So you can do something called pushing and pulling film. And yeah. so that, that relates more to the ISO. So, so let's say this roll of film that I, that I put in my camera today is an ISO 200 film. And I may decide that I want to shoot it at an ISO 400 or an ISO 800. So that's called pushing film. So mm -hmm. when I meter for that scene, I'll take a meter reading as if I was shooting at ISO 800, even though the okay. film itself is, is, is a stock 200. And what ends up happening is, of course, I end up exposing it to less light because I'm taking a much shorter exposure, right, If I, in that scenario there. But when I go to develop the film, I can actually using that program once again i can say well yes i'm developing this roll of film but i don't want to do it at the box iso i want to do it at 800 iso it'll then correct the time for me and then make usually a much longer um, developing time so what it does typically is it will really increase the contrast of that photo um, okay. some of the some of the ones that i posted online i did some from niagara on the lake and that was iso 125 box film that i shot at iso 800 so okay. it was a much, much longer development time. And yeah, the results I had was just deep, deep contrast. The blacks were super black um, and the highlights were still well maintained. It was, it's actually, it's, it's beautiful. So it is a creative tool that you can use for sure. But for the longest time, I just, I, I typically still tend to stick with box speed because I'm afraid that I'm going to forget <laughs> what, <laughs> what it was I was thinking in the field, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, so, so that's, typically what the chemicals will look like there. And I'm just gonna come back to really quickly. There we go. So now that my chemicals are prepared, you just, you, you go in order. So the first one that I'll pour into the top and there's actually, um, uh, it does have the ability to pour the chemicals in and out of this without exposing that film to light. So your developer will go in first. You'll start the clock on your, your app that tells you uh, what the recipe is. And then using this little thing here, this is essentially like a, a stir stick. Uh, it goes into the tank here. And then you will agitate the film, simply moving the film within the chemical. And you will do it typically for the first 10 seconds of every minute that you're developing. And the app will prompt you to do that. So 
And that's a way to ensure that the, the developing liquid is exposed uh, equally, I guess, all, all around that film. Okay. And so at the end of the first developer stage, you'll pour that back into your beaker and you'll pour in the second chemical, start the clock. And yeah. typically for the type of black and white film that I've been using most of the time, it's like 11 minutes for the developer, um, one minute for the stop bath. So that's a very quick step. And then the last one is five minutes for the fixer where it's removing all the excess uh, silver highlight that wasn't exposed to light. And huh. um, yeah, so, and then once you're done, you're good to go. Once, once you've finished that last step, uh, there's a rinse step. Well, you'll simply rinse it under, under running water, but you're safe now. You can pop this thing off. I can run it under water. And then when I'm done, I will take this out and I will pull the, the film right off of it. And I will be looking at uh, photos on a strip of film. It's fascinating. Yeah. And, and yeah. I said to Paul earlier, it never gets old, never um, gets old, never gets old. <laughs> and um, so really quickly, I had two different um, uh, developing tanks. I just wanted to show you the other one quickly. Yes, this one says squeeze me. Squeeze me. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> there is a method to that madness and I'll explain it. <laughs> this is a really neat developing tank and this is what's necessary. Well, it's one of the ways you can do it um, for large format film for the, the four by five sheet that I showed you earlier, this one mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. So the way this one works is you literally have a film holder like this. And Man. you, yeah, you simply load each sheet into the holder. This I can load up the four at a time inside that holder. Okay. I'm doing this perfectly here, but that's okay. And then once you put it back in, you seal this one shut. And the reason they tell you to squeeze me is because yeah. when you push this down, you give it a squeeze here before you tighten this down, it creates a better airlock uh, and it controls any, any leaking. But mm. once it's in here, it's again, a light tight solution. I can now, and, and now it's no different than the other steps that I told you with the Patterson. You pour your three different chemicals in one after the other for the correct duration. And uh, when you're done, you open her back up and you pull out a, um, a developed sheet of film. Man. Yeah, so, what a process. so these, yeah, so these two here, um, this, the Patterson tank can develop two 35 mil rolls or one uh, 120 roll inside of that. And then this, of course, is what I use for the four by five. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, so let's fast forward again. Uh, I've developed the film. Typically, once I take it out, I have a string hanging here in my man cave okay. that I, um, I, I will hang that film from just using some clips and I'll let it dry for a few hours. Okay. So once it's done, this is where you now need to go to the next step, which is scanning the film and essentially digitizing that film. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple different ways you can do that. And, and what I'm going to show you first, if I want to pull this up here, Take screen, here we go. So this again was a bit of a do it yourself project. Love it. So when you think about, there's a couple ways you can um, digitize a negative and sorry, I should have done this real for real fast first. Um, here we go. Let me show you this. So this here, there you go. There, there's an expo, there's a developed, uh, negative of the medium format film, the mm -hmm. uh, the 120. Okay. And then of course here I just have a 35 mil. Okay. So I got those there. Now, when it comes to scanning these, of course, we, we've all heard of actual flatbed scanners. Um, and, and that is a technique that you can use. If you have an Epson scanner, you know, it's, it's the only drawback to that, I would say the quality is okay but the time, the speed that it takes to scan a negative is, is painfully slow. And I'm, I'm just taking that advice from others that have done it and used it. Um, Thankfully, very early on, I was introduced to another idea, which for lack of a better term, we call it DSLR scanning. And what you're doing is using your modern digital camera, you're taking a photo of the negative. So wow. what I did is Flash I went out. Yeah, so this here, what you're looking at on screen is actually a what's called a developing stand and it was used uh, primarily in darkroom photography for creating enlargements uh, on photographic paper i sourced this one i found this one very inexpensively on kijiji and picked it up and it was missing pieces and everything else the thing that i wanted out of it more than anything was this upright right here and you can see that this attaches this was just some spare wood that i had this upright bar has a little wheel on it here that I can spin to move this whole assembly up or down. And at the end of this, I don't know if you can see it, but that's actually a ball head 
uh, right there. That's mm -hmm. mounted at a 90 degree angle. Mm -hmm. Now I will attach my EOS R to this uh, ball head facing right. straight down. Right. And I use my 100 mil F 2.8 macro lens, which is a fantastic lens uh, for, for macro photography, because essentially that's what I'm doing here. And using this up and down motion with this arm, I can raise or lower my camera so that I'm perfectly aligned over top of the film inside of a holder. And this is what mm, that is. Cool. Yeah, so what you're looking at here is, so this is my EOS, EOSR looking straight down and I'll show you the holder in a second, but this is a holder. There's a negative that is being suspended inside of that holder. This is actually an old iPad box <laughs> that I've repurposed. Oh, yeah. Inside the nice. iPad box, I have a, um, a light pad and I've created a hole that is just the exact right size for a square format six by six negative. So, and that's really to prevent any excess light from going up into the lens. Um, I'll actually turn the lights off in my man cave here as well when I'm, when I'm doing this process so that really there's nothing else that may reflect off of that film to create any, um, yeah. any anomalies there. So if I go back to here, I'll give you a little. I love up. it. So this is in that photo. This was the film holder that I was using. Uh, this one here is by a company called Nomography, and it's called a Digital Lisa. And this is the one that you would use for the 120 film. And so the way this thing works, if you take this apart, it comes apart in a few pieces here. Now, if I had a long strip of medium format film, it would be 12 images long. Obviously, I would have to cut it into threes. And I can place this inside of this holder like that. You simply put this on top. This will hold it flat. Close this lid down. And now I can remove that, lift this up. And now, as you can see, that is being suspended inside of that holder. And the goal is to keep the negative perfectly flat so that when I have my light source underneath, that's what the camera sees, right? Okay. And you want it flat so that, of course, you, you don't have you, you can find the focal plane and you can get the whole thing in focus. This, this particular wow. model works very, very well, I find, for for 120. They create a similar one for 35 mil. I, I can't endorse it. <laughs> it's um it doesn't hold the film very well at the sides. It's it's too oh, close. Wow. And well, the reason I think what they tried to do it, as you know, with 35 mil film, it has sprockets on the side of it. And these little sprockets here, the holes, and also the wording of the type of film are quite trendy. <laughs> and you'll notice that a lot of yeah. film photographers love to include that in their photos that they that yeah. they post. So I think what these guys tried to do was create a holder that would just grab on enough that you can yeah. still see those sprockets. But I found more than anything, the film just wouldn't sit still. It, it, it came out too easily. Hashtag so I'm going to show... Yeah, so I, I, I hate to say it, they're not going to send me any sponsorship money. <laughs> That's great so, stuff for a sponsor. <laughs> so I quickly want to show you some alternatives. So, um, so that you know that that's one method there, but right. you can also get holders that are like this. Now, the beauty of a holder like this one is the entire roll. So let's say I develop that thirty-six image roll of uh, thirty-five mil film. Mm. I don't have to cut it at all. I can literally feed. Now I have this one here. It's already cut. But I can feed this into the end. And what you'll see mm. is it starts to come through here. You see that there? Yeah, yeah. And then as I put the light underneath it, you can just advance okay. it from one frame to the next, right? The, the speed, uh, hands down, I think this is the best method because you can get through an entire roll of 35 mil. Uh, sorry, 36 images, probably in yeah. you know, five minutes. <laughs> um, yeah. Where nice. And now to pivot back to flatbed scanning, a flatbed scanner for one frame alone could could in many cases sometimes take up to 10 minutes or more. I've heard so. So wow. Wow. this is definitely this in combination with the DSLR scanning okay. is yeah. I think absolutely the way to way to go. This is How one that's is made. That? Well, this one here was made by a company called uh, Oh my gosh, Negative. Negative supply, I want to say, is the company name. This one, I think, was ninety bucks. Um, bucks. Not inexpensive, but they are they are pretty much the premium out there for the, for this. But mm, okay. a good friend of mine, actually Jim, once again, made me a three D printed one. 
Oh, nice. That, yes, if you own a 3D printer, you can make Jeez. your own. What? So, so, showing, those. <laughs> so showing you here, so this is now, this one's designed for um, the 120 film. But once again, same concept, oh, just man. feed your film through it stop on each frame to take the image and this now is nothing more than uh you know the cost of the material uh, i i i'm assuming this would be just a few dollars in material right so yeah. uh it can and, and ultimately even the negative uh this one here i mean there's 3d printed components within this so that's all they've done they and they've marketed it so great option um and then for the large format you can see this one will hold the single sheet of film same thing yeah. Yeah. Just keeps it perfectly flat and you can lie it on top of a light source. Yeah. Okay. Now wow. so the so the so once we get that negative um digitized and I bring it into the computer. You have been digitized. I have it you have been digitized. <laughs> I'm gonna very quickly show you here. So this is typically what the what the negative will look like. So this is a color negative. Uh this is portrait four hundred yeah. film. But uh, I've, I've imported this into Lightroom, and I want to show you just the last step, which is turning this negative into a positive. And this <laughs> is how fast this is how fast I can do this. So um, I'm going to do it live. So live at it. We love live, live. edits on this show. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I took a white balance reading off of the border. Okay, right. I'm very quickly just going to give it a quick rotation. This was a square crop, so I'm just going to do a one to one crop to get rid of just a little bit here. Okay, doing this really quick and rough. Now, I use a software called Negative Lab Pro. There's a couple of different ones out there. And actually, you don't even really need that software. There are ways to do it in Photoshop where you can invert the image and stuff like that. But Negative Lab Pro is, is a nice bundled, uh, kind of a very, very easy to use um, program. So it's just a plugin for Lightroom. And when it comes up, it confirms what the source was. In this case, it was a digital camera, meaning it was a DSLR scan. Uh, the color model, most labs that you take your film to use one of two scanner types. It's either the Frontier scanner or the Noritsu scanner. I think those are the most common, commonly used scanners, and they're, they're quite old. They're decades old, these units, mm -hmm. but they're still in use today. And Negative Lab Pro actually gives you the ability to select which one you want, and they have slightly different looks. So far, I've simply been using the, the Frontier. I haven't really dabbled any differently. And then all you have to do is say convert image. And what you'll see is you'll get on screen a negative that has been converted to a positive. Oh, wow. So, and within cool, Negative man. Lab Pro, you can do a little bit of tweaking. I typically bring the highlights down a bit. Um, one of the things I should have mentioned earlier about film is that it has incredible dynamic range, uh, naturally. Um, and uh, there are some films, I should say, some color films that have a, actually extremely narrow uh, dynamic range. But the ones that I'm using, like Portra uh, for color or um, the, uh, the Ilford ones that I'm using, the HP5 or FP4, they have incredible dynamic range. And they retain the highlights exceptionally well. So mm -hmm. what you typically will do is you'll overexpose by a stop intentionally, right? Because you know that the highlights are going to be safe. And I want to make sure I bring up that shadow detail. So yeah. almost default every time I convert one here in Lightroom, I'll, I'll bring down that, that highlight a little bit. And then I try to minimize the editing of these because we use film for a reason. Um, every yeah. film has its yeah. own look. Yeah, every film yeah. has its own look and feel. And uh, Portra has beautiful color saturation. And, and But in the dark room, typically in the film dark room, you would still do a lot of dodging and burning, contrast control. and. Mm as you know, that's certainly something you can do in the digital darkroom as well. So I will typically shape the image using dodging and burning uh, in Photoshop just to give me that depth that I want. And so a quick final edit on this one, uh, I'm probably a little on the darker side, but that's that's kind of what I uh, what I landed on for this one here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, interesting. Yeah, Roy's so, asking uh, the, D, the, D, the DPI setting on there. Uh, the DPI, so oh, a great, great question. So now when i take an image of um when i take an image of a, a negative so i one of the things you can do if you really want to increase the resolution so so by default my my eos r is a 30 megapixel camera i believe that gives me i forget i think it's 6500 by 4800 pixels now 
one of the things you can actually do with the negative is take a panorama of the negative if you're if you're following what i'm saying there so um i've actually taken a medium format 120 square negative and taken nine images of that negative so i've literally moved it along and taken a nine image panel a three huh. row panel of right. the negative huh. and i i've managed to create images that were 500 megapixels uh 700 megapixels uh in incredibly high detailed images so mm -hmm. in many cases far surpassing anything that i create out of out of camera on my osr yeah. so this one here this was I, I didn't do anything like that with this one um i'm gonna scan zoom back out again obviously there's a lot of texture that comes with film grain it, it's it's a look that um you know there's still sharpness there but there's definitely grain and texture to it yeah yeah, looks, but looks fine, but as, yeah. as far as creating enlargements, though, um, you would have no issue whatsoever with DSLR scanning. If your intention was to make an extremely large print, I would just do a panel. Um, actually, one of the recent ones, one of the first images I did of um, on large format, I did, I think it was a 12-shot panel of the negative. So, so wow. three rows of four type of thing. And it turned into a 1.5 gigabyte file. It was just outrageous, and, and <laughs> it was almost bringing my my computer to its its knees. But but um, right. never be afraid of the the quality that you're going to get through DSLR scanning. I, I think it's uh, yeah it's the way to go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So so that in a nutshell, guys. Um, that's <laughs> kind of what I wanted to talk about. That's I don't know if you have any questions what, at all. What, what a process, man like yeah, uh, sure. so like what's like what's like what's the average time like for, like the developing like how many like how many hours do you spend oh my gosh like, um on, so on I, a given night on a given night like oh my gosh well so well, this is what's really cool about this so i could go out this morning uh and and take some pictures right um yeah. i could uh, uh using a, a one of my bulk loaded rolls let's say 20 images i can come back i can develop it i can let it hang dry off my my string here for a couple hours dslr scan it and actually edit it and have it out that that evening right yeah cool. that's how fast you can do it where again if i was to take that to a lab i'd be waiting three four days maybe even a week yeah that's the advantage um, right I mean, that's the advantage of like doing it at home yeah. you don't have to wait so long yeah and and the cost yeah. there's a, there's an original outlay of cost no question to to buy the materials and yeah. but i think over the long term if it's something that you want to do this is the Oh, I mean, I think this is the cheaper way to do it, but I also think it's more fun. It's not going to be more fun for so, everybody, yeah. but yeah, for in, in my well, case, it's a sense more of fun. like a sense of like achievement, right? Like you, yeah, yeah, you as a, you actually created something yourself, yeah. and not yeah. just you know press it, right? I mean, when I even with digital photography, one I think what I like the most about it is actually crafting an image, as I would say. So I love right. to use filters. I love to use drop in, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, graduated filters and stuff like that mm -hmm. to try to shape the image before it even gets to the sensor and that that's really rewarding when you can do that film just takes that to another level right so you have a little bit you have even more control of pushing and pulling film um all the filters you can use all the filters the same way and uh yeah it's, it's pretty neat yeah no that's great well, right a fun. question of your your ideal 120 format camera my ideal 120 format camera yeah yeah is this one <laughs> so um I, I always said this one here so actually what i'll do is i'll go on an overhead because this will be kind of fun to show you so right. when i first started out um i definitely lusted after a hasselblad and uh, i'm sure most of you have heard of hasselblad yeah. and what's so great about them is that they're modular and yeah. and i can demonstrate for you here what that what that means but this so this camera here is called a zenza bronica and I don't want to say it because I know somebody will criticize me for saying it, but a lot of people will say it's a poor man's Hasselblad. Oh, it's boy. a lot less expensive. Um, doesn't quite have the same How cachet, much but this one here, I mean, oh. used was probably about a thousand bucks. If you were to try to buy a comparable Hasselblad, a 500 series, like a 501, 502, I think they went up to 503. You're probably three times that, if not more. Um, you know, one of these backs, if you wanted to buy an extra back, might be 80 to to $100 for the Bronica. You'd probably pay $300 for the Hasselblad. So again, it is the cheaper way to get into a modular medium format system. 
But when I say modular, this is what I mean. So that's an interchangeable back. That's where the film gets loaded. So I can have one of these with color, one of these with black and white when I go out for a day of shooting. And I can actually interchange these backs mid-roll. So I could take two black and white images and say, oh, I want to do color now. I'll just pop it off, put on the color back, and now I can shoot color. Uh, it obviously has um, interchangeable lenses, right? And even the top, now this is what's called a waist level viewfinder, where you look down from the top to compose your image. Um, this is interchangeable as well. So this can actually pop off. And if you wanted to, you could put on a prism finder or there's different attachments as well. So that's literally the system, Whoa. right? Cool. This is, I, I would have to say, this is my favorite uh, medium format camera uh, design because um, the, the other one that I showed you, the icon, that one is certainly a lot of fun because it doesn't get much more manual than that. But this one here, this has been a joy to use. Wow. Yeah. And I, I don't know if I can do this quickly here. I might try anyways. Let's see if I can. It also has one of the best shutter sounds ever. Okay, that's cool. Let's see, let's see if I can do this. <laughs> Live shutters. Oh, that yeah. thing is here. It, I mean, it, it literally wakes the dead. It is so loud. Um, and, it, 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 and how does that sound for funny? Like that? That's um, <laughs> that's a new a, that's a new theme music. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a sense. It's a it's a sensory thing. I can't explain it. Uh, I have a few different cameras that just have um, a very distinctive shutter sounds, mm. and they're they're almost intoxicating. It sounds crazy, but yeah. when you uh, when you trip that shutter, especially with the remote cable release. It just stirs the soul. I can't yeah. explain it any other way. Yeah, Absolutely. Fireworks, fireworks in the sky, yeah. and the whole bit. So, so that's my. I'd say that's my favorite medium format. One, I am going to quickly okay. share my my favorite thirty five mil. Mm -hmm. um, this is a Leica. This is a Leica three F. Uh, this one again is from the early, uh, probably from the early fifties, nineteen fifty three, fifty four, and right. again the just the finish on this thing, the the mechanics of it. Uh, it's just, no. it's, it's stunning. Yeah. It's, uh, where'd you find that? Um, this was again, purchased online. Um, uh, actually <laughs> my gosh, I keep referring to Jim many times over. He's going to Jim. Gonna if he's watching by the way. Yeah. Hi Jim. <laughs> he, um, he was great. He, he knew that I wanted one of these and he was really keeping his eyes open and he reached out to me one morning and said, Hey, uh, I, I know of somebody that has one of these that he's just listed online. Do you want me to, um, to, to check in with them and so he he helped me a lot in that and uh, it was just an awesome journey because there's a lot of history like uh i mean i just i think it's one of the most incredible brands and wow. um i won't do the story any justice uh so i'm not even going to attempt to try to tell it but do yourself a favor and, and look up uh the like a freedom train if you can look like a freedom train like like a freedom train just look that story up and um okay. it's a pretty heartwarming story and and this camera uh Kind of plays right into that that story oh, as well so interesting yeah and then of course i only own the one uh large format camera which is the uh the one that i showed you earlier the the graphlex and oh, yeah i just think this is the coolest thing it's just um, <laughs> yeah um, man you rock the, you rock out with that it's yeah yeah it's the cool. um the interesting thing about this uh to shoot large format there's something literally called the the, the large format dance and it's a series of steps from beginning to end. I want to say, depending on what you qualify as a step, anywhere from 15 to 20 different steps to take a photo with this camera. And, All right. and, and that's right from the point of setting it up on the tripod, getting it ready, uh, extending the bellows, attaching the lens, doing your preview. And, and, and then even once you're done that, there's a whole process of loading the film in the back. And... Um, and if you kind of mess up any one of those steps, you, you, you potentially it's could true. mess up that single sheet of film. And wow. uh, so it's it's something it's you just take a Yeah, it, it is wow. a craft. Absolutely. A craft. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oops, sorry there, guys. Wow. It's going to go back to, uh, there we go. There we go. Trying to get back to you. There you go. There we go. So, Excellent, man. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. That's uh, kind of what I wanted to go over. Any other, yeah, any other questions? Roy, Roy's, Roy's asking if you want to do some workshops for people that want to learn this stuff. <laughs> you do I don't know where I you would... do it, though. I don't know where you do it. Like, you do it well, like, in your house? Like, where do you do it? So um, kind of going back to um, how I learned this, I mean, yeah. um, one of the great things about this is that 
there, there's a great community of photographers out there that want to teach. Um, that's how I learned, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Jim, he's going to laugh at me. Jim was great. Uh, Jim literally spent, uh, time with me, uh, virtually. We, we just had little yeah. video calls here. Okay. He helped me do my first, um, my first loading of the film into the Patterson tank. He walked okay. through the first development of the chemicals for me. So I would happily pass that on uh, to hmm. anyone that wanted to take that time and do something similar. Yeah, I And I know. think that's, that's really, really important that we just continue to pay this knowledge forward. Right. Yeah. And, um, and what's really cool is that young people want to know about this. Yeah. Um, that's what I find just awesome. Um, yeah. You know, they uh, uh, it's, it's kind of hip almost. Look at that. Just popped in the chat and said hi. Hey, Jim's <laughs> here. <laughs> yeah. Shout out, Jim. Yeah. So I'm trying to get All my right. focus there you on go. There. Um, yeah, I want to say his website is uh, solos.ca. I'm going to look that solos. up. Solos.ca. Sure. Yeah, his okay. name is Jim Solos. S O L. Uh, Jim, you're a legend. S O L L O W S. Yeah. Look you him you're, up his, you're his best student. <laughs> oh, that's, there you go. Thanks. There you um, go. He. Uh, incredible photographer great teacher and uh and, and i okay. hope to i hope to be able to do the same and and pass this on to uh, anyone that wants to learn right well so, you definitely have roy roy signing up because he's all over it so there could is be, he oh good there, there could be something to this in terms of um yeah offering workshops so yeah it's it's, it's a lot of fun yeah it's a no, lot of for fun. sure yeah, yeah absolutely absolutely like what do you um is there, is there something that you're trying to learn next with film photography um, right now I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like you, I'm not much of a winter fan. So yeah. all I want to do now is just get to the point where I can get back out and start shooting. Um, um, there's really no excuse. I mean, there, you can obviously take some beautiful images in the winter time. Uh, the one that seems to interest me the most that I really want to get out there is with this guy. Yeah. And, and I want to be one, there with you when you do that. Too. Yeah. <laughs> and you and Evans, and Evans, Evans, Rucka, you're you're gonna blast her. <laughs> I'm 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 seriously interested, man. I've yeah. got a couple of film cameras, but I haven't shot in a in years. Yeah. So it's so much fun. And, fun. Um, what's neat about that camera is that you're gonna be exceptionally selective, right? Um, because every one is a like I said, it's a three to four dollar frame of film. You only get the one shot at it, and um mm so you take a lot more time the, the composition the metering you just and then you by the way i think i triple check it right before i actually press the shutter but uh there, i don't know what it is about that that process i just find so appealing with that camera but um yeah i just want to get out there with all of them yeah 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 absolutely ben saying the, the crown graphic is such a great tool it's pretty cool yeah it's really neat it's really really neat and there's something magical and I, I'm not really, well, you know what? I might be able to kind of show you here, um, through here, through the back is, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to demonstrate this here. Is this going to work? I doubt it. Oh, I don't anyway, know what's happening. What, <laughs> it's not working. Matrix, but, the matrix. but what's, what's on the inside of here is actually the, what's called the ground, the ground glass. And, um, so you've, you've probably seen those old photos where, where people have that, the hood over top of their head. Yep. Yeah, and, yeah. um, of course, the reason they do that is because they need a completely dark space to be able to look at mm. that ground glass. And when you're outside, the image of what you're looking at that, that passes through that lens is, is, is basically um, displayed on this. It's almost like a live view. If you can think about it as a 70-year-old right. live view. <laughs> All right. No, what live view. But the image is reversed and it's upside down. So huh. talk about composing in a different mindset man. yeah that's uh, that's like inception style man it, it is and actually <laughs> i find it actually it's quite ideal because it you no longer look at the scene as it is uh as a building yeah. or as a landscape scene you now look at it in the components that are within that scene um right. your leading lines your yeah. your foreground interest it it, it actually yeah. makes it a more technical approach yeah it so tra it trains you better yeah. So yeah. when you have that hood over your head and you're looking at that ground glass, I can't explain it, but ground glass is magical. And even all the cameras that I have that you look straight down, like the, uh, the Bronica, it has a ground glass in there as well. There's, there's just, I can't explain it. There's a depth to that live view that you're seeing on that uh, ground glass that okay. you, just, you just don't get it in digital. You just don't, don't get, get it. it. Just no, don't get no. it. So, yeah. Sony's so there you go. So there you go. 
So we're we're gonna get out and we're gonna shoot uh, large. Yeah, no, I, we 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 do yeah. need to get out and uh, and practice. <laughs> 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 I think there's double applause, man. Jason does not come nice. up first. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. <laughs> um, kind of yeah, no, that's a fantastic presentation, 100%. Uh, maybe Thanks, as guys. we just close up, like, is there, for people that want to get into film, just in general, like, do you have, like, a, do you have, like, a tip for people or some advice for people that are starting to get into it? Oh, my gosh. Uh, do you know what? It's an, it's insane, the content that you can find on on, on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, it's It's amazing. The, some of the channels that are out there that uh, and they will walk you through a lot of these steps i'll be honest i, I still refer to a lot of that as well mm -hmm. but um if one thing i guess one suggestion i might be able to make that if you're thinking about it i do it sooner than later um okay. film camera prices they're they're only going up and yeah. it's funny when i i'll i'll get a, a, a model of a camera and i'll be watching some i don't know youtube videos about it from five years ago because somebody did a great tutorial on all the features of that camera and they'll they'll say oh yeah i pick pick this up for 25 bucks or whatever and you're like well that's not the going price now it's it's you know it's five times that so yeah. um you know, try to hop on yeah but but you can get some really great deals uh you know you know when we're thinking about modern cameras think about an eos r an r6 or an r5 you know five thousand mm -hmm. dollar cameras so all of a sudden a 500 hundred dollar camera doesn't sound so crazy right and yeah. you can get a really really good film camera for 500 bucks so it's um but obviously it's not going to have all the bells and whistles that you get today we're, we're quite pampered with our with our cameras today and we were talking about this before we started about how i never second guess whether or not i'm going to get the shot with my digital camera because i have live view i have a histogram i never yeah. overexpose because it tells me if i'm going to overexpose yeah. Yeah. um so obviously the learning curve is there with film uh, but the goal yeah there you go you asked what the goal is the goal for me is to get to the point where i learn um proper metering techniques so that i okay. nail the shot every time because i'm yeah. i still wouldn't say that i'm 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 there fully when it comes to metering a scene manually and, and getting it right so that's a yeah, whole awesome. second yeah yeah well, so that's, that's great what, yeah yeah that's great um <laughs> ben so much content but uh he's looking for his chemistry refresher <laughs> uh, ben ben like he's been on he, um Ben's also heavily into film, so cool. Well, he's Ben all, probably he's can appreciate it. it's a lot to try to cram into an hour, but I hope we. Yeah, no, there's there's a, there's a lot of information. I'm sure you you'll be yeah. back on the show to talk about other things because uh, I'm sure we just cracked the surface here, right? So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, a little bit of everything. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's great. Uh, thanks, Jason, for doing this for us. Uh, mm -hmm. Excellent presentation. And uh, thanks everyone for watching. You guys took away a couple of things. Uh, again, Jason's social links in the description. Go check him out. Yeah, he's fantastic. And uh, Brian, any final thoughts? Um, I'm not a film guy. But, uh, <laughs> I probably will never. Well, I won't tell now. Go to film, but it. I'm too much of a run and gun style photographer. Yes. Yeah, it's just it doesn't suit my style at all. Yeah. Believe it or yeah. not, you can get uh, you can actually get grips for film cameras that'll whip through mm -hmm. four or five frames a second. It'll do it for you, but you'll you'll be done in seven seconds, right? Your yeah. roll of film will be done. It, it's not good for that. <laughs> no, yeah, no. I'm, I'm, uh, and I'm with you about macro. I would love to try macro photography uh, on the film side, but I'm very much a run and gun macro guy when it comes to yeah. bugs, mm -hmm. and I'd be. And I, I can't imagine yeah. trying to shoot a, a theater show like because I do the brand yeah. new musical. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I can't yeah. imagine I trying know. to do a show with film. Changing film, yeah, changing time. film. <laughs> yeah, I mean, considering I usually shoot about a thousand photos a show. Oh yeah. my gosh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Be a tough one. Yeah. No thanks. Yeah. But it doesn't. Well, you can use the drawing, I'm not yeah. interested in the process, but it's not something I can see myself doing right now. Sure. You just yeah. need the Bronica with a hundred backs and you're good. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll build it back to me. Uh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But uh, other than that, Jason, great presentation as always. Great. Thanks, Thanks for guys. being on Thanks again. Thanks for letting me ramble. We on love having you on. Yeah. We yeah. love having you on, man. Oh, yeah. Thanks. And uh, over to Evan. Evan? For final thoughts. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Um, I've, I mean, I, I shot film for a little bit before moving to the digital world, but yeah, um, I haven't sh uh, shot a single film in maybe what seven years. 
Mm. So he's, and I never developed myself. So looking at you, <laughs> the process and the <laughs> development stuff is just kind of bringing back some memories about, yeah. oh, yeah. maybe I should pick up one of my film cameras and try it. And I, I, I yeah. said at the last show that this year for sure, I'm going to at least try to shoot one roll of film for the year. Yeah. So, oh, <laughs> so we'll see. Oh, Evan. <laughs> I'll be happy Excellent. to join you. Do, so you still have film cameras? You still have film cameras? Yeah. Or you do. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. 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 <laughs> You know, it's neat. A lot of people ask me, can you still buy film? Yeah, you can. I mean, you can, yeah. you can go to Henry's oh, sells know. film. Yeah, uh, Vistec still sells film. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's great. Because yeah. I, I, I think I, I have everything I need to shoot film. I have a light yeah. meter. I have um, two film cameras still. Cool. Um, yeah. A couple of lenses, manual lenses. Because what I've been doing is all my lenses from the film days, I yeah. kept. Plus, I've been picking up some from stores and stuff but what i use them for mainly right now is i use them for uh for, for video sure. i convert some of the old film lenses onto my sony camera yeah. and use that for, for yeah. video so i still have a lot of uh minolta lenses from yeah back in the oh, days gosh. but i just haven't shot a film in in years gosh so. i wish i could just do that quickly enough and i don't know if i can no i can't get it quickly enough but one of the one of the most you just touched on it, one of the most fun things to do is um I can actually using adapters. I can adapt some of these old 70, 80 year old lenses on my EOS R. It is a cool. I thing. I love that. Is, I just is, I love the feel of it when I do that yeah. for video, right? So yeah. I've I've been collecting manual old manual lenses just for that yeah. purpose of of converting them for um, to digital for for videos. And, yeah, they're gorgeous. They give a video. unique unique yeah. vibe when you shoot them yeah. on video. Yeah, they do. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I was introduced to that idea, and now I almost want to get a, an adapter for every vintage lens that I have. To put I've, on I've got one for almost every brand. Yeah. I have one from um, Pentax to Sony, um, yeah. Minolta to Sony, Canon FD to Sony. I've got adapters everywhere. <laughs> well, I can tell you, now I can't show you because I'm actually shooting this on the EOS R right now, but this little Leica lens, beautiful yeah. lens, but boy, does it look hilarious on the front of an EOS R. Uh, this this little silver thing sticking out, but um, yeah. but but it's it, it, what's really neat though. It's all manual focus, manual aperture, and it's it's yeah. really cool. Yeah. Like like this one right here, that's yeah. um, a Minolta MD. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is an M forty four M forty two to yeah. to Sony, um, and I use it all the time. It was just yeah. a I use it all the time um, when I'm shooting B roll and stuff like that at home, especially. Yeah. Um, nice, it's pretty convenient. Yeah, it's, it's happening. Beautiful. It's happening. We're all we're all going out shooting film, except for Brian. <laughs> for Brian. Brian can use for his Brian. digital to shoot us as we're shooting. Yeah, film. exactly. He's, <laughs> yeah. I, actually, I actually like shooting photographers. So, nice. yeah, exactly. Nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank thanks, you Jason. so much. Yeah. Yeah. Final, so final, much, final thoughts, Jason. Any final thoughts? No, I just really, I, I, I truly appreciate uh, that you let me come on here and. Uh, uh, and You're let me passionate. spew off because I'm I'm very passionate about this stuff. I'm very much uh, still a student of it. I'm still learning, so I don't I don't consider myself an expert in it. But um, but I know enough to be dangerous, and uh, I love that you let me like share that. it. You know enough <laughs> yeah. to be dangerous. That's a great tagline. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I like that. Should be a T-shirt. Think about it. <laughs> Should be. That film there is not net dead, and I know enough to be dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, man. You never know. <laughs> yeah. Merch. You're merch good. sells sometimes. Um, I guess that wraps it. There's no, no any other questions. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks again, Jason, for rocking it. And we'll see you guys thanks, next man. week for another guest speaker, brand new to the show. We'll keep that a mystery for now. Thanks, Jason. Awesome. Nice. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.